Hi, this is Brad Constantine, and this is a podcast recording of the Doctrine and Covenants of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Even though this is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, every effort has been made to be as doctrinally and historically accurate as possible. Every day a new section of the Doctrine and Covenants will be released. I hope that you'll visit this often and be able to share this uh, with your friends. Thank you. Hi, and welcome back to this Doctrine and Covenants podcast. This is going to be for Section 8. So we'll start off with the uh, heading. Remember these uh, series of sections are regarding Revelation, and so we're going to continue to talk about Oliver Cowdery receiving Revelation. Uh, This section heading reads, Revelation given through Joseph Smith the prophet to Oliver Cowdery at Harmony, Pennsylvania, April 1829. In the course of the translation of the Book of Mormon, Oliver, who continued to serve as scribe, writing at the prophet's dictation, desired to be endowed with the gift of translation. The Lord responds to his supplication by granting this revelation. It seems probable that Oliver Cowdery desired to translate out of curiosity, and the Lord taught him his place by showing him that translating was not the easy thing he thought it to be. In a subsequent revelation, section 9, the explanation was made that Oliver's failure came because he did not continue as he commenced, and the task being a difficult one, his faith deserted him. The lesson he learned was very necessary, for he was shown that his place was to act as scribe for Joseph Smith, and that it was the latter who was called and appointed by command of the Lord to do the translating. There must have been some desire on the part of Oliver Cowdery to be equal with the prophet and some impatience in having to sit and act as scribe, but when he failed to master the gift of translating, he was then willing to accept the will of the Lord. And that was by Joseph Fielding Smith. Verse 1, Oliver Cowdery, verily, verily, I say unto you that assuredly as the Lord liveth, who is your God and your Redeemer, even so surely shall you receive a knowledge of whosoever or of whatsoever things you shall ask in faith with an honest heart, believing that you shall receive a knowledge concerning the engravings of old records, which are ancient, which contain those parts of my scripture, of which has been spoken by the manifestation of my spirit. Yea, behold, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost, which shall come upon you and which shall dwell in your heart. Boyd K. Packer said, The Holy Ghost speaks with a voice that you feel more than you hear. It is described as a still, small voice. And while we speak of listening to the whisperings of the Spirit, most often one describes a spiritual prompting by saying, I had a feeling. Revelation comes as words we feel more than hear. Nephi told his wayward brothers who were visited by an angel, ye were past feeling that ye could not feel his words. The scriptures are full of such expressions as the veil was taken from our minds and the eyes of our understanding were opened, or I will tell you in your mind and in your heart, or I did enlighten thy mind, or speak the thoughts that I shall put into your hearts. There are hundreds of verses which teach of revelation. President Mary G. Romney, quoting the prophet Enos, said, While I was thus struggling in the spirit, behold, the voice of the Lord came into my mind. Enos then related what the Lord put into his mind. This, President Romney said, is a very common means of revelation. It comes into one's mind in words and sentences. With this medium of revelation, I am personally well acquainted. We do not seek for spectacular experiences. President Kimball spoke of the many who have no ear for spiritual messages when they come in common dress. Expecting the spectacular, one may not fully be alerted to the constant flow of revealed communication. The Spirit does not get our attention by shouting or shaking us with a heavy hand. Rather, it whispers. It expresses so gently that if we are preoccupied, we may not feel it at all. Verse 3, Now behold, this is the Spirit of Revelation. Behold, this is the Spirit by which Moses brought the children of Israel through the Red Sea on dry ground. Joseph Smith said, A person may profit by noticing the first intimation of the spirit of revelation. For instance, when you feel pure intelligence flowing into you, it may give you sudden strokes of ideas, so that by noticing it, you may find it fulfilled the same day or soon. Those things that were presented unto your minds by the Spirit of God will come to you, will come to pass. And thus, by learning the Spirit of God and understanding it, you may grow into the principle of revelation until you become perfect in Christ Jesus. George Q. Cannon said, The same spirit of revelation that Moses had has rested upon men that have held the keys of this kingdom, whether it was during President Brigham Young's life or at the present time. That same spirit of revelation rests upon him who holds the presidency as senior apostle in the midst of the people of God. The apostles of this church have all the authority, they have all the keys, and it is within the purview of their office and calling to have all the spirit of revelation necessary to lead this people into the presence of the Lamb in the celestial kingdom of God. 
Verse 4, Therefore this is thy gift, apply it unto it. And blessed art thou, for it shall deliver you out of the hands of your enemies. Then, if it were not so, they would slay you and bring your soul to destruction. O remember these words and keep my commandments. Remember, this is your gift. Now this is not all thy gift, for you have another gift, which is the gift of Aaron. Behold, it it has told you many things. In the book of commandments, this was called the, the rod of nature which has caused considerable speculation that Oliver Cowdery had some kind of a divining rod by which he could receive revelation. Then comes the supposition that in changing this text to read the gift of Aaron, Joseph Smith decided he was telling more than he he intended. Such conclusions do not seem to represent good doctrine, good history, or a correct appraisal of the prophet's purpose in making this change. Consider the following. First, there is no record or statement tracing to either Joseph Smith or Oliver Cowdery that so much as hints that Oliver had or used any sort of a rod to receive revelation. Second, the divinely ordained system by which the the Book of Mormon was to be translated was the Urim and Thummim. There is no justification for the supposition that Oliver, when granted the privilege of translating, would do so by some other means. Here the Lord said he had been given the gift of Aaron. True it is that Aaron had a rod which became a serpent when he cast it down before Pharaoh, but he did not use it to receive revelation. Aaron had another gift, the Urim and Thummim, for that purpose. Third, in Doctrine and Covenant section 6, Oliver was told that he had a gift by which he could ask and receive and, and even obtain a knowledge of the mysteries of heaven. He was also told that he would be given the gift by which he could translate even as my servant Joseph. If he was to translate even as Joseph, he would have to translate by the same means used by the prophet, the Urim and Thummim. Fourth, in this section, Oliver is again told that he would be granted the spirit of revelation, and in addition to that, he would be given another gift, the gift of Aaron, by which he had already learned many things. Certainly, the things he had learned included that which is contained in Doctrine and Covenants sections 6 and 7, both of which were received by the use of the Urim and Thummim. Fifth, it would be difficult to suppose that Joseph was attempting to obscure anything in making the change from rod of nature to gift of Aaron. 18, and that's from the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, given that he left intact the promise that Oliver would hold this gift in his hands. We know of no Syriac device that Oliver could have held in his hands except the Urim and Thummim. Finally, both Joseph and Oliver had been promised the gift, the keys of this gift. Joseph never used a rod in translation. The gift he used in connection with, or in common with Oliver was the Urim and Thummim. Lucy Maxsmith said that Joseph referred to the Urim and Thummim as a key. It was by this key that the angel manifested those things to him that were shown him in vision, by which also he could at any time ascertain the approach of danger, either to himself or the record, and for this cause he kept these things constantly about his person. In yet another instance, Lucy Maxsmith recorded that Joseph told her he had a key by which he translated she said she did not know what he meant, but he placed the article in her hands and, and examined it with no covering but a silk handkerchief, found that it consisted of two smooth three-cornered diamonds set in glass, and the glasses were set in silver bows connected with each other in much the same way that old-fashioned spectacles were made. We conclude, therefore, that the gift promised to Oliver Cowdery could be nothing other than the Urim and Thummim, and that Joseph's purpose in making this change was to clarify rather than conceal its meaning. This change assumes that the reader will know that the gift given the high priest in ancient times was the Urim and Thummim, but then the whole story of the restoration assumes knowledge of the ancient order of things. It may be that the Urim and Thummim were referred to as a rod because they were connected by a rod to the breastplate Joseph received with the plates. The prophet's brother William described the means by which the Urim and Thummim were attached to the breastplate, saying a pocket was prepared in the breastplate of the left side immediately over the heart. When not in use, the Urim and Thummim was placed in the pocket, the rod being of just the right length to allow it to be deposited. This instrument could, however, be detached from the breastplate, then went away from home, but Joseph always used it in connection with the breastplate when translating, as it permitted him to have his both hands free to touch the plates. As to nature, in the phrase rod of nature, the dictionary of Joseph Smith Day defined nature as comprehending the works of God. Verse 7, Behold, there is no other power save the power of God that can cause this gift of Aaron to be with you. 
in other words, the Urim and Thummim, therefore doubt not, for it is the gift of God, and you shall hold it in your hands and do marvelous works, and no power shall be able to take it away from, to, away out of your hands, for it is the work of God. And therefore, whatsoever you shall ask me to tell you by that means, that will I grant unto you, and you shall have knowledge concerning it. Remember that without faith you can do nothing. Therefore, ask in faith, trifle not with these things, nor do not ask for that which is which you ought not. Ask that you may know the mysteries of God, and that you may translate and receive knowledge from all those ancient records which have been hid up, that the sacred and according to your faith, that are sacred and according to your faith shall it be done unto you. Behold, it is I that have spoken it, and I am the same that spake unto you from the beginning. Amen. I bear testimony that these things are true, and that as as Joseph and Oliver translated the Book of Mormon by the gift and power of God, uh, by the use of the Urim and Thummim, and I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. See you next time. Bye.